Dell Atomo 13 is a stunning laptop, yet it seems like even the technologically inclined have never heard of it, with even fewer having seen one in real life. But come on, just look at it. Dell went from selling thick plastic laptops to this aluminum beauty. How did it happen, and more importantly, why did it fail? Let me take it out here. This is the new MacBook Air, and you can get a feel for how thin it is. Yeah, there it is. To understand why this laptop even exists, we have to go back to the year 2008. Apple had just launched the MacBook Air, the future which could slip into a standard manila envelope. This is a device that didn't exactly surprise many, given that, especially in 2008, the media had all the rise on Apple, but it stunned consumers nonetheless. At just shy of three quarters of an inch thick, it shattered the previous thin laptop record holder, the Toshiba R200 from 2005. This, unsurprisingly, cost almost all major computer manufacturers off guard, including Dell. As consumers bought the MacBook Air, the need for a thin and light laptop shot up in demand, even before the term Ultrabook was even coined. So this brings us back to the Atomo. Atomo translated from Latin means to fall in love with, which Dell definitely hoped consumers would. It was essentially their response to the MacBook Air, and in fact was thinner than it in the end. But despite its ultra-thin profiles, there's a lot more to know about how this laptop came to be. Starting with a slight tangent though, while researching, I initially assumed that the Atomo had a fairly standard development cycle, until I came across this concept rendered by one Nicholas Denhez, allegedly from September 2007, months before the MacBook Air launched, which I found incredible. As for if this really was a backburner idea that Dell truly had or not is another question, but nonetheless it's strikingly similar to the Atomo that eventually came to fruition and certainly does make you wonder. Back to the actual product though, like with any crazy new tech product, there were leaks and rumors spreading in the tech world months before it launched. A post from the now defunct luxury goods publication Uptown Life referenced the Dell Atomo's early September 18th, 2008, which caught the attention of a handful of technology writers. It was played up as something pretty awesome and people were curious, and allegedly when Ashley Vance for the New York Times asked Dell's Vice President of Consumer Sales about the Atomo, all she got was a gaping expression as she looked away. It was body language that suggested something pretty substantial was coming. Rumors spread that it would be even thinner than the MacBook Air and potentially up to $400 cheaper, foreshadowing withholding. When interviewed, the company said close to nothing about the product itself, except for a cryptic message from Dell spokesman Bob Kaufman which read, I think we need to get some more iconic products out there so people associate Dell's brand with other things, hinting at thinness. More confirmation came in the form of a cached version of Dell's website with accessories for this mysterious Atomo computer. Speculation didn't have to wait long though because at CES 2009, the final Atomo design was shown at a press event. However, only a brief preview of it was shown compared to the attention they gave to their other products, disappointing the press. In fact, it may not have even been a working unit given that they didn't open it up all the way nor turn it on. I wouldn't know for sure though because I was only able to find one picture from CES that year with the laptop actually on. Despite that though, pre-launch reception was mostly positive, and with the way Dell was describing this computer, techies were fairly excited. There were a couple of delays related to Foxconn not ramping up production at first, but on March 17, 2009, the finalized model launched. It only caused initial waves, which may suggest poor marketing, but despite what people would have you believe, Dell definitely did market this thing, making it the front page of the Dell website for some time and even making a custom webpage for ordering it. When it launched though, it was unfortunately in the middle of an economic recession and some people definitely noticed that. And you can kind of imagine that Dell wishes that they had a time machine right now. Because between the cheap netbooks and the collapsing portfolios, this is the laptop that just kind of screams, I just got my bonus check from AIG. It's really pretty though. 
The marketing of this thing was just insane too. Dell all of a sudden wanted to pretend that they're a luxury brand and got incredibly cocky and prestigious if you ask me. Josh Verlinger from ComputerWorld.com writes that, The ad mode by Dell website is hands down the most hilarious marketing effort I've ever seen. With fashion models in ridiculously unpractical clothing, toting around the aforementioned shiny, underpowered laptop while ultra-cool music plays in the background. This is one of the greater stabs given to the Adamo's marketing, but it had a point nonetheless. The Adamo was really trying to be something it ultimately wasn't, and you don't need me to tell you so. The original advertisements are still up on YouTube. Take a gander. Adamo was a name that, uh, as we started the project, we, we, we created literally as a, a code name. And it was it's, uh, it's a, it's a Latin name uh, meaning to fall in love with. And the goal of the project was to deliver a product that people would love. Well, I think when you see Adamo for the first time, um, it's just a stunning, elegant, minimalist form. Um, and then you start seeing the layers of materials, the aluminum, the real glass. Uh, and I think that when you touch it, it'll be an, you know, an experience you haven't felt before. That they, these are honest materials, um, that they have a certain temperature to them. What does that even mean? Uh, that comes from it being real metal and real glass. We managed to find some way to scorp the key, uh, so every uh, keycap are a little bit scalloped and make the typing very comfortable. We're on the hardware later, by the way, but this keyboard is awful. Uh, also, there's no compromise around connectors, so even though you have a very um, thin product, uh, the user has the ability to, to stay connected either um, through landline or uh, uh, wireless um, and have uh, enough ports to really uh, be productive. Compare this to the MacBook Air. It's also a high-end luxury product, but it doesn't feel as verbose. Despite this though, Dell still delivered a beautiful device. It won several design awards and even beating the MacBook Air of that time in the eyes of some people. What didn't sit so well with consumers though was the nearly $2,000 you'd be coughing up for a base model Atomo in 2009, which is over $2,500 in today's dollars. Keep in mind that you could get a base model MacBook Air at that time for well under that, and from a company that was already reputable in creating great luxury products. This was without mentioning how half-baked its execution was in comparison to the MacBook Air. The Air lasted longer on a charge, had a brighter screen, came with dedicated graphics if you wanted them, and it was just built better. This isn't to say that the Atomo was built poorly, but these little things like the small gaps in the aluminum and the fingerprint magnet plastic strip on the top of the keyboard would definitely make this laptop degrade, while the more uniformly designed MacBook Air didn't have these problems. When it came down to it, if you were spending almost two grand or more on a laptop, the MacBook Air was just better. This isn't the full story of the Atomo though. Later on in 2009, Dell slashed the price of the Atomo to only $9.99, actually making it pretty competitive. However, by the end of 2010, it was too late, and other companies had already developed their own thin and light laptops, not to mention the netbooks of the time that were eating into the ultra-portable PC market. At that point, the price was yet again slashed to $7.99 in early 2011, and I imagine Dell started losing money selling these things because they were very expensive to manufacture, with the aluminum chassis for example, costing nearly $600 to machine on its own. Interestingly though, according to XPS lead marketer Donnie Oliphant, this wasn't even purely because of material choices, but because of our ineptitude in regards to design. 
Prototype designs were handled in a really weird way, with the design team asking for computer's parts to be shoved into an already designed chassis, making for an unideal workflow. I imagine that headaches were had and design issues rampant. It is obviously not a very sustainable way to make a computer, and it was likely for the best that it wasn't very popular. This laptop is basically the definition of form over function, and I think consumers knew that. And so did Dell. So Dell actually took that one step further in 2010 and created the Atomo XPS, a laptop that was only 0.39 inches thick, barely enough space to cram a USB-A port into the chassis. This laptop was even more so not meant for utility. It had a really weird keyboard design, awful battery life, and performance that put it behind laptops from a good four years ago, even then. The only thing that was kinda cool is that they managed to somehow fit upgradable RAM to the computer, no idea how. Nonetheless, this is exactly what I call an experimental laptop design. The regular Atomo looks like a normal laptop for the most part, but Dell really doubled down on making it as thin as possible and nothing else here. Oh doctor, what do you think of this new Dell? Alright, this is the Dell Admodo. And we can't figure out how to open it. We just opened it a second ago. There's no buttons, no latches. There's absolutely, it's super thin, it looks super cool, and as soon as we get to open it, we will show you how it works. Okay, so we just look like idiots for the first three minutes trying to open this, but apparently it's a heat sensitive strip, so you just wipe your finger across. And it opens, and you see the little LEDs light up. <laughs> this is the dumbest product ever made by a human being. It's horrible. This is sad. And if you think that's crazy, apparently early prototypes for the Atomo XPS included the touchscreen and the trackpad, and a zero-profile touch-sensitive keyboard. Also, the regular Atomo may be rare, but the Atomo XPS is even rarer as far as I know. And I only came across my regular Atomo by chance. This one popped up on eBay after literal months and months of not seeing any units online. What I found really strange though is that despite that, replacement parts for the Atomo are everywhere. I found several listings for replacement batteries, keyboards, casings, and even motherboards. I noticed however that I couldn't find any replacement screens or replacement SSDs for example. And digging through a few Dell forum posts, I think I can piece together what happened. These laptops were probably destined for e-waste since they left the factory if you ask me. There seems to be so many examples of the SSDs failing and screens developing weird bubble defects that I can imagine people not wanting to pay the $300 or more price for the replacement parts. Unfortunately, like a lot of Adamos I've seen, they develop air bubbles behind the glass in front of the display, but it's still usable. This is further supported by the poor performance of these machines, non-upgradability, and nearly impossible user serviceability. I mean, think about it, rich people were buying these, not just a tech inclined. If you bought a $2,000 laptop, you'd probably hope it'd last you a while, but if you're constantly having to get it repaired, you probably wouldn't want to keep that laptop. Which is what I think explains the lack of working units, yet the availability of replacement parts, but also the lack of certain replacement parts. So yes, it's very likely that combined with the slow sales of this laptop in the first place, it shouldn't be surprising to see that it's so rare. With that though, the ending story of the Atomo is rather blunt. In mid-2011, the laptop was entirely discontinued and the Atomo line never saw another product. This might seem expected, but looking closer, the Atomo could have been a continued product series. For example, if you look on product development technologies websites, the design team who worked with Dell for the Atomo actually had a few concept images for what future goals of the Atomo would have looked like. In addition, Oliphant said that the XPS 13 Spider launched in 2012 could have been an Atomo product if the line had been kept alive. This isn't much of a stretch too, because if you look at the 2012 XPS 13, it shares a lot of the same design language that the original Atomo had, and even has the same keyboard font. Further intriguing are these concept renders I found on former designer at Dell, Nicholas Denhaz's website. In addition to the 2007 Atomo render, I found these concept renders for something called the Dell Atomo Next, a curvy, sleek, luxury laptop that looks like an evolution of the original Atomo. There were apparently plans for leather and carbon fiber finishes in multiple colors and likely Core i-series CPUs. I tried to reach out to Nicholas myself to find out more about his concept renders and work at Dell, but unfortunately he never responded. I did, however did manage to reach out to Alex Grusin, former Senior Vice President Consumer Product Group of Dell up until 2010. I didn't get too many specific details from him, but he knows that the team he worked with was great and helped the Atomo, along with future XPS products, be designed. From there though, there's actually a pretty interesting company story to be told as well. You see, the XPS was a brand for consumers that had existed since at least 2001 for performance computers. But in 2005, Alienware was coming on the scene with high performance laptops. Back then though, Dell had a broad range of products, but could take one or two design risks per year. This is how we ended up with their line of niche products, and at least I guess, the Atomo. In 2005 and 2006, Dell sold one basic design of laptops, both different screen sizes. 
Dell had to compete with Alienware though, so they had to create a performance laptop, which they could do with their existing Inspiron chassis. This is why the 2006 XPS looks like an Inspiron but with RGB lights and some plastic tacked on. It wasn't really a new design. In 2007 though, that changed, because coming out of 2006, Dell acquired Alienware and now had a team of people to create a new performance laptop, which ended up being the Dell XPS M1330. It was critically acclaimed for its performance output given its 13.3 inch screen form factor and its new radical design departure from previous XPSs. And through the 2000s, Dell put out many strange form factor computers, one of the most famous being the XPS 2010, with its 20 inch LCD screen. And in a way, that computer reminds me of the Atomo, not in a physically similar way given that they're polar opposite in terms of form factor, but the nicheness of it because it was also an insanely expensive, experimental laptop appealing to a small subset of customers. But while trying these extreme ideas out, Dell ultimately found what consumers wanted. They found out that people didn't want the giant 20-inch portable as much and that consumers did want Ultrabooks. And ignoring brand names entirely, Dell stuck with that. And the Atomo may have just been a niche failure of a product, but without setting their feet on the ground, Dell never could have delivered the XPSs that we enjoy now. With that said now, as years passed, Dell's modern XPS line continued, yet yeah, it was a lot of its inspiration to the Atomo. Because the modern XPS is also a premium aluminum thin laptop with edge to edge glass, and it looks really sexy. And in fact, if I were just to photoshop a few modern laptop design cues onto the chassis of the Atomo, I think you end up with something not far off from modern premium laptop design language. I really do think that the Atomo series could have been a serious line of laptops continuing to this day, but that Dell was also smart to designate the XPS brand to a specific style of laptop instead of adding needless complexity to their lineup. That decision though leaves the Atomo with 13 as one of the coolest and rarest forgotten pieces of tech in the world. So, what's it like to actually use an Atomo 13 in 2021? In one word, slow. I don't actually have Windows 7 installed in here because honestly, I didn't feel like it. But I do have Cloud Ready, which is basically Chrome OS, which is Linux based. Even so, it's unbearably slow. Slower than some of the actual first Chromebooks, honestly. And the 2GB of RAM is not helping matters at all. You can get away with maybe 4 tabs in Chrome, but not a lot else. The low voltage Core 2 Duo P9400 actually will play YouTube videos in 1080p. And once web pages are fully loaded in, it's not the worst experience. But you're waiting so much on this computer to actually do whatever the heck you asked it to do. Now, this laptop did come with three configuration options, with mine being the mid-range model. The highest end desired model had 4GB of RAM, which is better, but it was also very expensive and very rare. Also, this may be a very thin laptop, but judging by the wear on this black finish and the scratches on the back plastic layer, you probably wouldn't actually want to be taking this laptop anywhere if you actually remotely cared about aesthetics. This piece of glass on the back of my unit is actually cracked and the black finish is worn around the edges of my Atomo. Taking the part of the machine is actually is relatively easy, even though it appears whoever was in here last had no idea how to open it, given these pry marks over on the bottom. You undo a few metal, metal latches with something like a screwdriver and the bottom literally just lifts out. Although you do have to disconnect the battery cable first. Also, I wasn't kidding about this battery literally being glued to the bottom of the laptop. This laptop is like, you know, super thin and has a super thin battery and the battery is part of the bottom. I don't know why. This Atomo was actually sold as no HDD, which I was disappointed by, only to discover that it totally did have the original SSD inside, but it needed to be reseeded. I then discovered that some cretin out there had cursed this computer with Windows 10, which ran like hot garbage, and with only 2GB of RAM, it was awful. But hey, at least the SSD is fast enough so it's not actually the bottleneck. And I find that ironic, because my Inspiron E1505 that was released three months, three years before this thing is actually faster. But while we're inside here, I want to take a look at how bad this design is. Because it may have been revolutionary, but this is not a good design. For example, the SSD is over here, yes? 
and there is a giant cable with a connector going all the way across here to this board, which goes through all this circuitry. And there's another gigantic flux cable going to this. That's like six points of failure for the SSD. And it might look like you can just replace this keyboard by, you know, taking out these screws and just sliding it out. But no, you have to take out the entire motherboard because the screws are like slid under here to save space. Also, this backlight cable is really unreliable. Also, there's a magnetic strip back here. It's made of metal that comes off. And behind here, we have a few other components like this LED for the power and two not even centered stereo speakers that are really tinny, really quiet and generally not very good. Flipping the laptop back around though, up front we have a 1366 by 768 p resolution screen at 13.4 inches with big fat bezels on, on either side. And this was actually the first laptop to use Gorilla Glass in its build. And also up here is a 1.3 megapixel camera. I don't know how it looks. Moving down, we have a full QWERTY backlit keyboard, which I remember that one advertisement I showed you of the guys like praising the keyboard. This keyboard is awful, like I said. These are scalloped keys, you know, it's supposed to be comfortable, but if you don't hit the key like exactly right, you get like the mushiest experience. It's not comfortable to type on. It doesn't have like a satisfying click that a lot of membrane keyboards even today are able to handle. We also have a set of media keys up here with the aforementioned really fingerprint magnety plastic strip thing. I mean, they work, but the volume keys seem redundant because you're gonna always have this thing blaring at full blast. Also, we have a fairly standard for the time trackpad. I think this is actually a metal surface. It might be plastic, but I'm not sure because of the finish. But below that, we have two plastic click buttons, which are mm, average at best, not very comfortable. Also, everyone's getting excited about the new ports on the MacBook Pro. But look at all the ports this thin laptop has. Ethernet, three USB, one of them being ASATA compatible, display port and power in, and a headphone jack? Count me signed up. No, but seriously, this might have been better than the MacBook Air of the time, but this really wasn't that great because a lot of people at the time needed things like SD card readers, express slot, and DVD drives, you know, it was 2009. Also, the original battery in here actually does still work, but apparently new, it only lasted like five hours, and now it barely lasts two. And yes, I know the Atomo is really rare, so I think it's really important I describe how this laptop feels because not many people are going to get to feel one, but it's kind of hard because we're thinking of modern laptops. I haven't been in the tech scene since I haven't been, I wasn't in the tech scene in 2009, of course, but this laptop feels, it feels like a prototype, honestly. Like I fully believe everything that Donnie Oliphant said about the design process of this thing, because this thing literally looks like something I draw up in CAD and then like imagine it was real. Like this thing is made out of solid aluminum, right? I'd have a hard time believing that because it doesn't have like the density of aluminum, despite being so heavy, which is ironic. J just hear this. And like the screen wobble, for example, that it doesn't indicate to me that this is actually supposed to be a really well put together product, which I think is basically what the marketing of this thing was. It was to like convince people that it was good, even though it wasn't really, and it was just insanely expensive. <laughs> But however it was marketed and developed and put together, I think it's no doubt that this laptop is incredibly influential to the laptop culture we basically have today. Because I mean, even in its own time, we've eventually gotten used to the limitations that this laptop has in our modern laptops, like a lack of ports, like decreased durability in some cases, or, you know, cramped trackpads or keyboards. And yeah, it's ultimately no surprise that a laptop like this didn't fulfill the promises that Ultrabooks would eventually bring. It's kind of crazy though, because I think even today, this laptop kind of stands out in a way. And when you tell people how old it is, they're like, what? You know? And needless to say, I think I'm really proud of being able to actually own a working condition Atomo, because not a lot of people can say that. And products like these are just so interesting to me in a broader sense, because this laptop, in almost all the articles I read about it is basically just glossed over. Like there's a couple articles about how XPS came, became so great in the laptop department, but they just basically glossed over the Atomo. And I know why, because from a business standpoint, it's not something that you really have to pay too much attention to. But to be able to actually tell a story here is harder and is something that, you know, I wanted to do with the Atomo because there's a lot of these obscure tech products on YouTube that have their own documentaries, like the Osborne One, a lot of the you know, Tech Tales by LGR and Techmo and Tech and stuff like that. But the Atomo doesn't have any, and I don't know why. 
With that said though, I obviously can't guarantee that all my information and reporting in this video is actually accurate about the Atomo, given that I couldn't actually reach out to too many people who were on the team of the Atomo, let alone have a ton of sources to go off of. However, if you know something about the Atomo that I didn't address in this video, I'd absolutely love to know in the comments. But yes, this is the story of the Atomo 13, the most important laptop that you've probably never heard of. This is Calc G, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.